All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Did you guys get rained on on the way on the way in? <laughs> you. This morning we started at 6:15 a.m. and like 6 like 12 a.m. it just started downpouring, so it did the exact same thing when you guys came in. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to be on page oh, page 14 tonight, I believe. Yep, page 14. And let's go ahead and pray first, and then we'll jump in together. Lord, I thank you for each person here. I thank you for their dedication to getting to know you better. And Lord, I pray that you would respond by just giving us more of you. Allow us to see you more clearly through your word. Allow us to understand you better. May the result of that be we fall more in love with you. We're more obedient to you. We enjoy you more. We connect with you more. We have a clearer understanding of who you are and that we're transformed more into your likeness. Uh, we ask that in your son's name. Amen. All right, so this is session two. We're doing humanity of Christ, incarnation, life, and ministry. Uh, so that's a lot. So <clears throat> I know sometimes when you do these, some of the topics are a little bit hard, but just we're going so quickly through some of these things where I feel like we're just like jumping on the tips of icebergs and we're like not even going anywhere near the depth of what we could in each subject. Uh, and that's intentional so we can get through more stuff. Uh, but maybe there'll be a day when we go back and jump on the one iceberg and just kind of dig down, just spend some real time looking deeper. Uh, <clears throat> but it still has felt deep enough, hasn't it? I mean, we're... I feel like we're plumbing pretty deep, um, but sometimes we'll jump through stuff that I wish we had more time to do. Uh, starting in this one, we just have to start with that first blue statement there near the top. Jesus in the incarnation was conceived by the Holy Spirit and he was born of a virgin. Why was it necessary for him to be conceived of the Holy Spirit? Do you think it was necessary? Yes. Yes. Why? He had to would, come from God. Yeah, so that way he would be born without a sinful nature. Okay, one. There's a second thing. I think you were going there. He had to, to be fully God means that God had to be involved in a special, unique way. So we don't know exactly what it looked like for her to be conceived by the Holy Spirit, but the result is Jesus is 100% God. Jesus is 100% man. Both of those things are true. Uh, here's a couple of verses on his deity. And these are verses that it wouldn't be bad if you at least memorize the concept behind each verse. One, Colossians 1.15 tells us that he is the image of the invisible God. The Greek word there is icon. And the idea is that it is a perfect reflection of the Father. Jesus is a, an image, a perfect reflection of the Father. Colossians 2.9 tells us that the fullness of deity dwells in Jesus. The fullness. So not 50%, not 75%, not 99.9%, 100%, the fullness of deity dwells in Jesus. John 10.30, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. Okay, so that's a good one too. Uh, those three are really good verses. We could have had 25 more verses there. Uh, fully human, I actually wrote out a couple of those verses below. Luke 2.40 says this, the child, Jesus, continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom and grace, of, and the grace of God was upon him. Luke 2.52, and Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. I mean, he was human. He actually grew up. He was at one point a baby. Jesus was a toddler. Isn't that weird? Uh, he was a teenager. He was a full grown adult. Like he went through the process of puberty just like we all did, like he did all that. So, yes. May I go back real quick? I yeah. wondered if you were going to say anything about um, conceived or, and born of a virgin. Um, what is the connection there? Why did Mary need to be a virgin? Why did Mary need to be a virgin is the question. What's the answer? No, I don't, it's a good question. Good, yeah, I, that's a good answer, Bobby Joe, because I didn't have one. I think that, that removes the question of who the father is. Like the fact that there, she's never been with a man means like never been with one. That sets it up for that to happen. I mean, I think that that's, that's good. I didn't have an answer to that, Bobby Joe, thank you. Um, so in those verses, we said he's 100% God, right? So he knows everything. But yet in those verses, it says that Jesus grew in wisdom. Can somebody explain that to me? Like, what does that mean? 
How did an all-knowing being grow in wisdom? He had to put aside some of his attributes. Okay. That, that being fully deity would, would bring with it because you can't increase in wisdom. God can't increase in wisdom. Okay. Right? So in order to increase in wisdom, the part of him that was fully God had to be suppressed, set aside. Okay. So he could increase in wisdom. So one answer is that he set aside his omniscience and his wisdom to be in a position to gain. Any other thoughts? Maybe it was the man part of him that was growing in wisdom. Hmm. It's like so that he could understand what it was like to be human. Yeah. So the God part of him wasn't increasing in wisdom, but like it or not, Jesus, until he was old enough, never put his own socks on. And then there was a day when he put his own socks on, and it was an experience he had never had before. The first time he shaved, if he shaved, um, if, if they shaved, I don't know. But the first time he did that, it was the first time he did that. So there was a growth in experience, and wisdom is like the use of knowledge. It's not like he didn't know what shaving was. It's not like he didn't understand it better than you, me, and the rest of the universe combined, but he just hadn't done it before. You know what I mean? So there, there is this increase in experience, which causes also an increase in wisdom. <clears throat> All right, let's go to those quotes there. Grudem has a quote that says, The fact that Jesus had a human body, just like our human bodies, is seen in many passages of Scripture. He was born just like all human babies are born. He grew through childhood to adulthood, just like all other children grow. And there's those verses again. And he grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and fa the favor of God was upon him. Moreover, Luke tells us that Jesus increased in wisdom, in stature, and in favor with God and man. Second quote says this, Jesus had a human mind. So realize that, like your human mind developmentally is different when you're 40 than when you're 20, than when you're 10, than when you're five. Developmentally, developmentally it is a different brain. Okay, so like that happened to Jesus' brain as well. He had little feet, and then he had big feet. He had a toddler, you know, toddler developed brain, and then he had an adult developed brain. That was part of his experience. Um, the fact that Jesus increased in wisdom says that he went through a learning process just as all other children do. He learned how to eat, how to talk, how to read and write, and how to be obedient to his parents, according to Hebrews 5, 8. This ordinary learning process was part of the genuine humanity of Christ. Questions about that. if if Jesus was were sinless or was sinless, uh, did he not ever TP someone's house or uh, you know go out and smoke behind the barn? So, so Hebrews tells us that he was a sinless sacrifice. He was a perfect sacrifice. The question being, did Jesus ever TP a house? or whatever else you said. Smoke behind the barn. Um, <clears throat> so to whatever extent it wasn't sin, we don't know what Jesus did and didn't do. If it's sinful to TP someone's house, then Jesus didn't do it. It was just a lot of fun and people understood. Maybe he did TP someone's house. Most likely they didn't have TP, but, um, <laughs> but I totally understand the question you're asking. Um, <clears throat> Toilet paper. Do you guys not? Do you guys not do that around here? Hey, we're not from your. I know. I know. Have you ever heard of TPing a house? I've, 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 I've heard of it. You know, the kids would get out in the middle of the night and they just get all the TP around the trees. It was a mess. Pastor Mike would never do this, but the way you TP a house is you roll, <laughs> unroll about ten feet of the toilet paper. You take that thing and you launch it and spin it real nice. I mean, it's beautiful how it rolls over the tree and leaves like this line of toilet paper. You run over, you run over, you tear it off another ten feet, back over. If you get enough people and you buy sixty-four rolls of toilet paper, which is very affordable, uh, you can actually cover an entire yard with it. And then if you go out and buy napkins, you can cover it on the ground, and it looks like it's snowed. So that's, there's, there's a possibility that an English teacher somewhere in North Canton, Ohio can remember that, but I just heard about it. I don't know anything about that. <clears throat> okay. So when it comes to thinking about the way Jesus was made up, this is not right. Jesus isn't like 
deity is over here and humanity is over here. Though his deity and his, human, his humanity were not separate from one another. So this would be a wrong way of viewing Jesus. Also, let's see what I do with my art. Uh, so he's also not like this. Humanity, deity, and then Jesus is somewhere of the combination in the middle. That's also wrong. Biblically, it's a single circle. Wow. That didn't work. Jesus is a singular individual with full deity and humanity 100% all the time. Now, this is Bible math. And I'll be honest, Bible math isn't, doesn't seem as good sometimes as the math you had in school in that there's 100% deity and 100% humanity in just one person. So there's somehow we squeeze 200% into one being. But Jesus is both all the time. Some verses focus more on his deity. Some verses focus more on his humanity. And if you only read the ones about his deity, it's really easy to sometimes to minimize his humanity. If you only read the verses about his humanity, sometimes you can minimize his deity. A few pages in, we're going to see all these different doctrinal errors. And usually those come from focusing on one set of verses over another set of verses. But if you look at the whole, Jesus is always fully God. He's always fully man. Let's look at the temptation, for example. Uh, Luke 4, 1 through 13, we're not going to read the whole thing, but it's very clear that the Holy Spirit, because it says so, the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness. And once he was in the wilderness, he did not eat for 40 days. So Jesus is starving hungry. His belly is completely empty. Satan shows up on the scene and he tempts Jesus. He tempts Jesus. Jesus uses the word of God to repel, to combat, to argue against the temptations that the enemy throws at Jesus. This is Jesus we're talking about. All Jesus had to do was to snap his fingers and Satan would have vanished. He could have said, get out. He would have gotten out. But what Jesus does is he gets himself into a position as guided by the Holy Spirit to be in the weakest state possible. So all he had to rely on was God and God's word. And in that moment of temptation, he leans completely on the Holy Spirit and God's word to answer the temptation, to deal with the temptation, to respond to the temptation. That's important because Jesus chose to live a life, and Matt talked about this earlier, where he lived it in submission to God the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit, relying on the words of God. He didn't have to do that. He himself was still fully God. But the Bible is very clear. He lived out of the power of the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit. We often equate a comfortable, catch this, we often equate a comfortable and convenient life to a blessed and led by God life. Often we see the opposite is actually true in the life of Jesus and his followers. A life on the front lines often consists of struggle, temptation, and pushback. So by watching the life of Jesus, Jesus had no sin, right? He did not sin. So the hard things in his life were not because he sinned, because he didn't sin. The hard things in his life were not because he didn't follow God's leading. He always followed the leading of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes I think we get confused. We think comfort, convenience, and temporary happiness are the things that God has for us. But if you look even at just the temptation, he was led into the wilderness. It doesn't say he was led to a bed and breakfast, right? He was led into the wilderness. So for 40 nights and 40 days, he was not sleeping on a Serta mattress, okay? Like he was not. He didn't eat for those, for those days. There was nothing convenient about the situation. His only, he probably wasn't experiencing happiness like you and I would by getting ourselves a bowl of ice cream. Isn't that kind of, that's happiness, right? Like a bowl of ice cream feels really good for about 10 minutes. So he didn't get any of those things, all right? But there's something in us that longs for those. I think what longs for those is the fact that we're kind of, we've kind of misconstrued some things. So God hasn't designed us so much for comfort, convenience, and happiness as much as he's designed us for joy. He's designed us for contentment. What's the top one? An idea? And peace. 
So that's what we're designed for. And he's given us this longing for peace, contentment, and joy in our life. But sometimes we get confused and we start looking for comfort instead of peace. Sometimes we get confused and we start looking for convenience instead of contentment. And all the time we get confused between ongoing, enduring joy in who we have in Jesus to the happiness that the little things in life that may or may not be honoring to him provide for us in the moment. So as you look at the life of Jesus, Jesus lives this kind of life, a peace, contentment, joy life. But it's hard, and there's struggle, and people don't treat him very well. From the beginning to the end of his ministry, not treated so great, but like he had these things. Jesus wasn't so concerned with these. If you and I looked at our checkbooks, if we looked at our schedules and how we use our time, if we looked at our relationships, if we looked at what we're investing into, if we looked at our, the values that we live by, which column would you tend to land in? I mean, every single commercial on TV is telling you you need to get in this column. Jesus, by example, is saying you need to be in this column. All right, this is just something for us to be thinking about. Uh, as we look at the life of Jesus, this is what always convicts me. Okay, Jesus didn't miss out on these things because he kept sinning. This just wasn't what he was about. But, so there's like a church in, in Texas that has like 24,000 members. I'm not going to tell you his name. But, well, his last name might be Olsen, but I'm not going to tell you his first name. Uh, like, he built an entire church on preaching this. I mean, preaching this. Like, this means you have a lack of faith. Did Jesus have a lack of faith? Now, he was pretty good in that category, right? So, even being led by the Holy Spirit, having full faith in God the Father, peace, contentment, and joy was his path, not comfort, convenience, and happiness. Okay? God might give us these things sometimes, but these do not even come close to comparing with these things. These are better, far better. It's just sometimes we don't like to believe that because the world tells us the opposite all the time. At the top of page 15 it says, the Lord leads us into places where we often need him more than ever. Okay? We often are stuck in places, taken into places where our dependency on him grows. We see that in Jesus' life. I encourage you, I encourage me to pray that our lives would be filled and guided by the Holy Spirit into spiritual growth, into ministry, that we would be willing to live being willing to live joyfully and to live life that, a life that changes the world even if it means we have discomfort, even if it means we have difficulty and struggle and suffering, because those are the things that produce what God wants us to have. Contentment, peace, joy, purpose, His values, fruit of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the question that we have to keep asking ourselves, are we willing to be uncomfortable to follow Jesus? And let's be honest, sometimes the answer is no. Because we have opportunities all the time and we choose comfort. We just do. I do. You do. We choose convenience. We choose momentary happiness. We just do. Um, Jesus' weariness and stress. John 4, 6. This is where he's getting ready to talk to the woman at the well. Before he talks to her, the Bible tells us that Jesus was wearied from his journey. And he sat down by the well. Like his human body would experience physical tiredness. If he took a long walk, a long journey, he was worn out, just like you and me. Luke 22, 41 through 44, Jesus begins agonizing over the fact that the cross is coming. He's, sitting, he's thinking about it. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. It says that he is, I think his words were, I'm overwhelmed to the point of death. That's a lot. I mean, that's, that's Jesus. He's 100% God, 100% man, and he's overwhelmed to the point of death. There'll be times when you will be overwhelmed in significant ways, where stress comes into your life and you just feel the weight and the pressure of the world around you, feeling like it's going to crush you. Jesus' sweat drops like blood in that moment. There might be days where you physically get worn out by just the pressure of the life around you. Jesus turned to the Father for help. We turn to the Father for help, but it doesn't mean the pressure always goes away. Life sometimes just turns into a pressure cooker. It is therefore not sufficient to recognize that Jesus Christ as the Son of God possessed a human body, but it is necessary to view him as having a complete human nature, including body, soul, and spirit. The whole thing. Jesus had the whole thing. Okay? The emotional life, a human soul intermixed with his deity, the whole thing is there. Luke 23, 47. This is just an interesting thing to think about. Even in the moment of his death, 
the onlookers looked at him and saw him as a man. Even as the miracles were happening around Jesus, they still walked over with a spear and stabbed him in the side to make sure he was dead, just like every other man. He was viewed as a man. So how do these two natures interact with one another? Do they interact with one another? This next topic is called the hypostatic union. How is it possible for Jesus to have 100% of two natures? Was there conflict? Was he ever in the position where he would say, I'm going to do this? And the other part of him said, no, you're not. Yes, I am. No, I'm not. I mean, was that, did that ever happen in Jesus' head? Was there ever that level of confusion? Was there schizophrenia? Um, did one part of his nature ever take precedence over another part of his nature? Was he ever less than fully God or less than fully man for a moment, moment in time? Okay. The hypostatic nature would say, no, no. I would argue you and I are much more conflicted than Jesus ever was. Because within you, you've been given a new, you're a new creation, you've been given a new nature, the Holy Spirit, but you still have the sinful nature inside of you. So within you and I, Romans 7 talks about this, is sometimes we want to do something and we just don't do it. And the things that we don't want to do, we just keep doing those things. So within you and I, the Bible says that there's a war being waged within us, within our members, within our mind, within our heart, there's a war being waged. Jesus didn't have that war. He didn't have that war. So we said before, Jesus was born without a sinful nature. So we're leading to this question. No one's asked it yet. Every other group has asked it up to this point, so I'm surprised you haven't. <clears throat> if Jesus was 100% man, did Jesus have the ability or propensity to choose sin? No. Yeah. I got a yeah? But he would. Well, let's, let's, okay, so, so the question is, could, could he have sinned? Yes. And the answer is yes. And no, I'm so far I'm getting a lot of yeses. I've heard like three or four yeses. Anybody on that side? That he could not have sinned? So he's 100% deity too. Could his, because, and it's, it's not like deity and humanity. It's deity and humanity. Like there was no point where he was just functioning out of his human nature. So the fact that he's human and deity at the same time. No, then he couldn't. Could oh, did you change your vote? Yep. Did you change your vote? It has to be no because he couldn't. What I meant when I said yes was that he could have changed things, but he didn't. I mean, changed the order of events to save himself. He could have. But okay. Did That's not the, really the sin. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So he. So, so history was at his fingertips, but the question is, sin. If he could have, he would have. If he could have sinned, he would have sinned. Interesting. All right. I like that. If he could have, he would have. What makes you say that? The sinful nature. I mean, if it's there, and you're, if you have a sinful nature, you're going to sin. So if you have a sinful nature, you're going to sin. But he doesn't have a sinful nature. Now, Adam didn't have a sinful nature. How did he do? He sinned, right? So Adam didn't have a sinful nature, but he chose to sin. But he also wasn't... He was just a human. Okay, so I've got... All right, so I've got some yeses and I've got some noes. How for him it wouldn't be sin? It wouldn't be sin. If he broke his own holy standard? They're all products of this creation. So I mean, that's the paradox of it. It wouldn't be sin. Okay. Okay, so you're going from a philosophical point of view. I'm going to kick back a little bit with a biblical point of view that if he like set a holy standard, clarified maybe say in the Old Testament, like do not steal, and then he knocked a guy over and ran away with his loaf of bread. Then who's that standard for? Well, I think it's a moral set standard guided <coughs> and designed from his own character and nature. So he would have to go against his nature to sin, right? Would his ways be above our ways supersede that? In, go his in areas where he hasn't clearly communicated, then we would have to say, well, I don't understand what you're doing, but clearly if you did it, it's not sin. In places where he clearly revealed his standard, and then he clearly broke it, so I'm saying like actual sin. Like he, no. like, like, like that's, that's the discussion. I see what you're saying. Philosophically, it's, it's a good point, but I'm just saying straight up sin. I was always no. taught that, no. that 
when Jesus went to the cross, it was his choice. Okay. At any point along the way, he could have, he could have bailed. So at any point along the way, Jesus could have bailed from the cross. Who else was taught that? I've never, I've honestly never heard that taught out loud before. Of the book. He chose the nails. He chose the nails, okay. Yeah, that's the plan. So we would say, and we talked about this last week. Was it last week? We called it the covenant of redemption. We talked about before God created the world, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit planned out how redemption would take place. Yeah. Jesus knew those nails were coming, so it wasn't a surprise when it happened. So... I guess I would say that that decision was made in eternity past, not in the Garden of Gethsemane. Though in the Garden of Gethsemane, you saw Jesus lamenting the fact that the pain was coming and separation from the Father was imminent. With the very nature of God, let's say that he performed a sin at that moment, that, that action would no longer be sinful. You're still on the philosophical thing. That's a good question. Maybe. I don't know. The scripture says, and always he was tempted as we are, yet was without sin. Right. So unless he could have sinned, that scripture is not... True. So, unless say, he, say the scripture again. So he I'm he was tempted in all he ways. Was, he was tempted in all ways as we are, yet was without sin. Okay. So if there was no ability to sin, then that scripture cannot be true. So. So you just did this, Matt. And we're all going into philosophical arguments here. Matt, you just said temptation equals ability. I think the ability well, what I'm saying is, is if you can't sin, if you have no ability to sin then what am I tempted to? I can't do it. There's no temptation. I can't, I can't follow through. You can't be tempted if there's no ability whatsoever to, to do whatever is being placed before you. Can there be desire without ability? But desire is sin. Christ mm. himself said it. Okay. So, so if I desire it, if I look up on a woman and I lust after her, I've committed That's adultery fine. in my heart, which is just as bad as actually committing the act according okay. to Christ. So he has to... He has to have had the ability to have any temptation. You can't be tempted. If okay. there is no ability to think it, there's no ability to do it, then it's not truly tempting. It can't be tempted. So, so Matt Walker just reasoned, I'm doing this for our podcast, so Matt Walker just reasoned <laughs> that it can't be temptation if there isn't the ability to actually act out on that temptation. And we also have another good point that if Jesus chose to do something because he is God, perhaps that thing isn't actually sin. Both are interesting. So, but here's where I want to land. <clears throat> Whether he could have or couldn't have, the main point is that he didn't. Okay, so we'll, we'll just land there. That's where we have certainty. The rest of it is just a really good conversation, but it really doesn't, like, we don't know the answer to it. I would tend to lean that, and this is different than you, but I would tend to lean he couldn't sin because there was never a point where he had a desire or an action or an attitude that was separate from his deity. Uh, but I would also say that scripture tells me, and there might be a little bit of a logical gap here for me, but the Bible seems to say this clearly, is that <clears throat> Jesus actually dealt with the temptation. Here's where I think he dealt with it differently than you and I do. You and I, when we're tempted, and it really is a tough temptation, we deal with it for, what, 35 seconds, 37 seconds if we're doing really well. Then what do we do? We give in, right? Where Jesus continues to bear it and deal with it and feel the weight of it and the temptation of it until it goes on to something else. So he actually bears the full weight of the temptation where you and I, we only bear it until we can stand it. And Hebrews says you haven't even stopped sinning. I mean, you haven't even held back to the point of shedding blood. I've never, you know what I mean? So either, either... I'm going to sin or I have to bleed. I'll, I've usually chosen sin. Like just, you, you have to, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> Jesus will go to the very farthest length of temptation and still not do it. Um, so that's kind of where I land, but I'm not saying where I land is better than where you land. At the bottom, it says this. It is important to remember that Jesus knew before he created man that he would become a man. Man was fashioned in such a way as to be prepared for Jesus' incarnation. So when God made us in his likeness, like he was preparing for himself the type of body that he would one day dwell in. So he had that in his mind when he was designing the way we would be. Wow. Okay, so if you knew you were going to live in a house, you designed the house to work in such a way that you're going to enjoy living in it. Jesus designed humanity and a human body and human nature that it would work for him to dwell in it. That's just interesting, okay, because he knew in advance that was going to happen. 16 at the top. Through the incarnation of Christ, the two natures were inseparably united in such a way that there was no mixture or loss of their separate identity, 
and without a loss or transfer of any property or attribute of one another, of one nature to the other. The union thus consummated is a personal or hypostatic union in that Christ is one person, not two, and is everlasting in keeping with the everlasting character of both human and divine natures. The human nature always remains human. The divine nature always remains divine. Christ is therefore both God and man, no less God because of his humanity and no less human because of his deity. All right? So down here, we already jumped on this question. Erickson says this, the person who resists knows the full force of temptation, referring to Jesus. Sinlessness points to a more intense rather than a less intense temptation. All right, let's go ahead and do this last little paragraph too. The sinful nature was not a part of man's original creation, and Jesus bore this sinless human nature as the second Adam. In his deity, he could not have sinned. In his human nature, he would have felt every temptation and desire, but he would, he would have never solely acted out of that human nature, as he was seamlessly human in deity at the same time, all the time. This is called the doctrine of the impeccability of Christ. Okay, so that last paragraph there, we could disagree a little bit on that one, and that would be fine, because that is not an essential of the faith. That's just us trying to figure out what the heck happened. Page 17. Let's look at some of Jesus' relationships. His relationships mattered a ton. First of all, his relationship to God the Father. Again, it says the fullness of deity is in Christ. The fullness of deity is in Christ. He's not lacking anything in terms of deity. So he looks to the Father as an equal, So in that relationship, he looks at him as an equal, but the Bible's also clear that he submits to the Father. He was sent by the Father. The, the Father is the one who gives him the words to speak, and the Father is the one who shows him how he's supposed to act and what he's supposed to do. So it might be kind of like if Luke, my son, was 30 years old and a full-grown man living his life, like he would be independent of me. He would still probably listen to me, and he'd ask me questions, but like he's also sort of independent. Now, that's that illustration lacks, but God's the one that made up that illustration. Once he calls, he calls himself the Father, and Jesus calls himself the Son. He made up the illustration. So they're equal, but yet there's a father-son type relationship there. Very interesting. John 14, 9 says that he perfectly reflects the Father. The nature of this relationship allows them to fully give and receive love, joy, and glory to one another. Because they're independent and fully God, they can give love to one another. They can enjoy one another. They can give glory to one another. Jesus devotes his earthly ministry to speaking the Father's words and sharing what the Father is doing and living as an exact representation of God the Father himself. Do you remember when he says that? Like the disciples are talking to him in like John 8 and 9, and he says, I'm here just to do what I see the Father doing. I'm here to say what I hear the Father saying. Like he's really living out what the Father looks like, what He does, and what He says. Jesus seeks the Father's glory, and Jesus seeks glory from the Father. He receives those who the Father draws to Him, according to John 6, 37 and 44. It also says that Jesus speaks on that behalf of believers, asking the Father to bring them into His glory, that we, you and I, the Church, might see Jesus and be with Jesus forever. If you ever just want a good devotional thought, turn to John 17, verse 25, and hear Jesus praying for you. And Jesus says to the Father, I want Bobby Joe forever to be in my presence and to see me in all my glory forever. Like that's his desire for us, is to be with him, see his glory forever. He asks the Father to make that happen, to make that possible. Yes? If Jesus and the Father were the same, or they are the same, to whom was Jesus obeying or submitting to? Or submitting? So they're the same and they're distinct. So like like you and I are two people, so that is like the Father and the Son, like two people, but yet they're also okay, so we just jumped into the Trinity. So we just jumped like right in the deep end of the pool, Carol. Um, <laughs> we have to honor the fact that they're distinct. The Father was in heaven, Jesus was on earth but they're both fully God. But they are independent of one another. But they're also one. Sorry, Carol, that's as good as that gets. 
<laughs> I can't answer any better than that. Um, the last thing there says, it is by the Father's power that Jesus performs his healings. So again, we see Jesus being led by the Holy Spirit. We see Jesus being empowered by the Holy Spirit. We see him healing by the power of God the Father. Jesus in and of himself has the power to do all those things. But he chooses to live life in submission. He chooses to live life in reliance on the Holy Spirit and in reliance on the Father. Does that sound familiar? That's how you live your life. So Jesus lived his life in a way that he can relate to what it's like to be you and me. He knows what that's like. He lived his life in reliance on God, though he was God. His relation to the Spirit. Jesus lives his life dependent upon the Spirit, much like we do. The Spirit empowers him. The Spirit directs him. Jesus teaches about the coming of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit's ongoing presence and work that will be experienced by his disciples. So if, I mean, Jesus kind of did this. This is interesting. So if I had a quiz and just had one question, and it was like two possible answers, so you're either going to fail or you're going to pass, and the two questions were, or it's, it's, it'll be a rather statement. I would rather have Jesus stay in my spare room and walk on earth with me for the rest of my life, or I'd rather have the Holy Spirit living inside of me for the rest of my life. Would you pick A, or would you pick B? B. 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 Good answer. Would be better if B Trudy steals. Trudy stole my thunder again, Matt. So <laughs> Trudy's right. G, so in John 13, in John 13, the disciples start understanding that Jesus is going away. Something's about to happen to Jesus. In John 14, he starts to comfort them, saying, if I go, don't worry about it, because I'm going to come back and I'm going to take you with me. The rest of John 14 and John 15, what's the main subject matter? The Holy Spirit. He talks about the Holy Spirit that whole time, even into John 16. And one of the things he says, like Trudy mentioned, is he says, it's better for you if I go. Because when I go, he comes. And it's better for you to have the Holy Spirit than to be walking around here with me. Which, I mean, let's just be honest. I mean, I know that we know the right answer to, but if Jesus was living in my spare room, wouldn't that be cool? It would be cool. It would be cool. But, but he says it's better to have the Holy Spirit than to be hanging out with me. Yeah, because he would have to go places, and then you would have him there all the time. Yeah, Jesus would go to Burger King, and you'd be stuck by yourself <laughs> eating lunch. <coughs> so, yeah, you wouldn't want that to happen. So we're going to go a lot deeper into that topic when you go through the Holy Spirit in in the fall. All right, C, his relationship to Israel, which is interesting. So we have to view it this way. Israel exists for the sake of the coming Messiah. The coming Messiah doesn't exist for the sake of Israel. Don't get that backwards, okay? Jesus, before, and we learned this last week, before there was an Israel, was standing in the Garden of Eden after they had sinned, and he looks and says to the woman, through you, there is one who is coming, a seed who is coming, who will crush the power and authority of Satan. So before there was an Israel, there was this proclamation that a Messiah was coming. When he grabs Abram, before he becomes Abraham, and says, you know, I'm setting you up for something. Here's some things I'm going to promise to you. One of those promises was, through you, all the nations will be blessed. So even when Israel only included one person, Abraham, the conversation was, through you, all nations are going to be affected. So all nations were always in view, even as God chose for himself a particular people. Okay? So the Messiah does not exist for the sake of Israel. Okay? Israel exists for the sake of the coming of the Messiah. Let's go to the other end. But he did come first to Israel. He did come first to Israel. And in their rejection, then he sends his disciples to all nations. So Israel is not the center of everything, but they do have some significance. I don't want us to overstate it, and I don't want us to understate it. Um, and there is still also a day when the Bible says, Romans 11, 24 through 26, and we know when the Bible speaks to the future that we may understand it and might get it right, or we might be a little off. Like when they were waiting for Jesus the Messiah to show up, a lot of them missed it because it's hard to understand when the Bible speaks of the future. How much is figurative? How much is literal? That's hard. But in Romans 11, it talks about a day when ethnic Israel, when a lot of ethnic Israel returns to Jesus. They've rejected him for now, for a period of time, but then there's a day coming when they will turn to Jesus in great numbers. There'll be like a 
a Jewish revival of some sort. Okay, so that day is still coming. So Israel isn't the centerpiece, but they do have significance. So I just want us to have that balance, because I've watched churches get out of balance with that. The bottom. And we've talked about this a little bit already. Jesus' relationship to the nations. Jesus is the long-awaited seed of the woman from Genesis 3. Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise made to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Joshua, to David. Like, I could list 40 verses here where he talks about this. That to the nations. Luke 2.32 is interesting. You remember Simeon? Simeon is this guy that showed up in the temple when Jesus was brought to the temple as, a, as an infant. And it's like God had kept him alive to give him the chance to see Jesus. And it just warmed his heart to see Jesus. Like he held on to Jesus. And when he described Jesus, he said this, Jesus, the light to the Gentiles and the glory of Israel. So you see both components there. Through Jesus, the light of the gospel would be made known to all nations. But he also says there, this is the glory of Israel. Israel was for this. God protected a people that through this people, Jesus would come. He is the glory, the crowning achievement of the people of Israel. So from the beginning, the nations were in view. All right. Jesus' ministry and mission. Again, just this topic could be an eight-week core class but we're going to do it in 15 minutes. All right. So Jesus was sent by the Father. John 3:16, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son. John 4:34, Jesus said, "My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work." John 6:38, for I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. And there's multiple other verses that say the exact same thing. I didn't even list 2021. 20, like, and I just looked at John. So I just, just looked at one gospel. I didn't even list all the verses from that one gospel. Jesus has been sent. He's a sent one. The Father sent him into the world. Don't you think John 6.38 almost implies that his will would be different from the Father's? No, I just think it means that his will is in submission to the Father. But I don't know if that means it would be For different. I from heaven not to do my own will. Mm -hmm. but the will of him who sent me. And it also says, a couple of chapters over, I and the Father are one. Right. So there's a unity in will, but there's also a submission to the Father. And I, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't take that verse out of context of the other verses. But I see what you're saying. I don't think Jesus said, now if I came down on my own, I'd be like getting milkshakes every night. We'd be going out. That whole TP thing, I want to try that out. Like, <laughs> I don't think that's where he would be. He wouldn't be rolling in that direction. No, no, no. Um, <clears throat> I even say that. What's that? Why, does, why even say that? Why does say not to do my own work? To clarify his submission would be my opinion. But, Matt, that's an opinion. Sorry. Okay. But I have some good commentaries on my shelf. You can borrow any of them and look that question up and you tell me what it says. Uh, Jesus chooses and transforms his disciples. So in Matthew 4.19, he shows up. We talked about this on Sunday if you were here. Uh, he goes up to a group of people and he says, follow me. Follow me. Have you ever done that in a restaurant? Just gone up to a table of people and said, all right, follow Jesus. Now's your time. Follow Jesus. So that wouldn't work very well for you and me. But for Jesus, he walks up and like, that's how he initiates that conversation. Follow me. And then he says, and I will make you fishers of men. So he gives them a lot of information in a very few number of words. First, a decision has to be made. You need to choose to follow me or not follow me. And if you follow me, here's the process I'm going to take you through. I will make you, not you will make yourself. I will be the potter, you will be the clay, I will form and mold you into a fisher of men. In other words, I will make you my disciple, and over time, you will be making other disciples. Did the disciples have a choice in the matter? I'm gonna add just one quick question, you know. <laughs> well, follow me. I think the I disciples... Mean, the Holy Spirit must have so there's a, there's a, them. There's a class coming up in the fall where we're going to talk about how much of that is your choice, how much of that was God's choice when we chose God. Right. And that's going to take the full hour, Carol. So yes, I, I probably <laughs> won't be able to hit it all, all right. <clears throat> in our last 14 minutes. Plus, we still have a page and a half to go through. But it's a good question. Um, they all said yes. But we do have people, like the rich young ruler, who Jesus offered to him, and he says... And he just turns and walks away. So there are those who reject Christ. In fact, there's more people who reject Christ than follow Christ. I guess that kind of answers. Um, Wasn't there a young man he asked to follow him? And he 
said I have to go bury my father? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And he says, let the dead bury their dead, right? And he moves on. He moves on. So, <clears throat> so that's how Jesus presents himself to them. Now, sometimes he would say this, repent and believe. Sometimes he would say, the kingdom is here. So he used different ways of saying things depending on who he was talking to and his context and his environment and the rest of the other things he was talking about. So today, you and me, how do we even start conversations like this? So we've already agreed, going up to a table of people in a restaurant and saying, follow Jesus, isn't going to get the job done. I mean, they'll probably say, go away. I mean, like that's, it's not going to work. So <clears throat> how do we do it? Uh, we're going to do a whole huge core class on just how to share your faith, because I think we all need to keep thinking through that and getting better at it, because it's hard. And it makes the average person nervous. If I know I'm going to be waiting to talk to someone that day, my stomach still gets upset no matter how many times I've done it. Um, Dan, you might be the only guy I know probably has no nervousness. Do you still get nervous, Dan? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Dan's probably shared the gospel with more than all of us. But like, there's still just this nervousness that pops into our hearts, into our stomachs, and into our minds when we know that conversation is coming. So one like question that I have found that, I, that I'll ask frequently, my world right now is 95% of the time Let's be honest. 98% of my time is with Christians. I come from a world where 10% of my time was with Christians. 90% of my time was as a personal trainer with people who didn't know the Lord. Like I just spent all my time with people who didn't know the Lord. So I was always trying to think through how to have those conversations. And one thing that worked a lot was is just saying, so how would you describe where you're at in your spiritual journey? How would you describe where you're at in your spiritual journey? We still as a society are okay with people being spiritual. Okay. Now, depending if you go farther towards the East Coast or farther towards the West Coast, people don't like Christianity so much. I think it's still okay to be a Christian around here, but in San Francisco, they might not appreciate you being a Christian. Even back in Louisville, like Christianity wasn't considered desirable. Like if you say that, people would look at you funny like there's something wrong with you. Here I still think it's okay, but I think it's going to be okay for a long time here to be able to talk about spirituality. So, where would you say you're at in your spiritual journey? people just start talking. Because no one's ever asked them that question, but they think about it. No one talks about it, but everyone thinks about it. So that gives them an opportunity for their internal world to enter into their external world. And then you just keep asking probing questions. They'll tell you a little bit about their history, and you say, oh, tell me more about that. Why'd you make that decision? How'd you determine that? Why do you value that? Just keep asking questions. You'll be amazed. You will find a couple little hooks in their story where you can go a little deeper with them. Even if you can't get to a point where you feel comfortable sharing your faith, this always happens. If you ask questions long enough, eventually they look at you and say, well, tell me about your spiritual journey. Why do you care about this? Now, you don't get many softballs pitched to you in life. When you do, you swing, right? You better swing at that ball. So, <clears throat> so that gives you an opportunity over and over again in your life just to share a little bit about what God's done in your life. Now you've started a conversation that will continue, and you're not even one that will have to keep it continued. Like They will want to keep asking you questions. It will be appropriate for you to ask them questions. So use that. Okay? Just, that's a good one. Just tell me where you're at in your spiritual journey and just see where it goes. Okay? I believe when we open up those types of conversations, God likes to work in those moments and help guide them. All right? So that will probably work better than what Jesus did there. You can try to follow Jesus, follow Jesus, and I want you to tell me how that goes. Okay? And then we'll, we'll talk about that. All right, Luke 17, 20 through 21. It says, the coming of Christ and the beginning of his ministry communicated that the kingdom has come. Not fully, but it has come. The disciples in the church spread the knowledge of Christ, and more and more hearts will live under the rule and reign of Jesus in an ever-growing kingdom. So, depending on your background and how you understand things, I think sometimes we think that there's a day coming when, when Christ will establish his kingdom, so we just kind of have to wait till that day. There's really no authority now under Jesus. His presence is less than what it should be. But that's not what Jesus says here. There is something in the future for us. It looks like Jesus is going to have a personal reign here for a thousand years, but right now we're not lacking anything. Jesus is very clear. The kingdom has come. He says, all power in heaven and on earth is mine. I've got it all. Nothing has authority over me. So when it comes to a kingdom and authority and power, Jesus has got it all. 
And he also says, wherever you go, I'm going to go there with you. So his power is supreme and his presence is always available in here. So if we have those two things, there's nothing lacking. We're not waiting for a better day or some consummation to be able to share the gospel and live life fully in his kingdom. Okay, like his kingdom is here and he's the Lord over it, so it's powerful. So being a part of the advancement of the kingdom is exciting because Jesus is the one advancing his kingdom through you and me. And he's with us every step of the way. It's exciting. So you have to wait for something awesome. You're a part of something awesome. The kingdom is here. Jesus declared it. And Jesus rules and reigns over it. Jesus' method of discipleship. So <clears throat> we, see, we saw him go really deep with three disciples. Peter, James, and John. He just pull aside sometimes and go really deep with those three. But he also had 12 guys that traveled with him all the time. There was even like a group of ladies that oftentimes were around with him too. Like his ministry was males and females. He sent out 72 to represent him in small towns. Most likely he knew who those people were. He didn't just say, all right, Bob, I don't know who you are, Bob, but you're going to represent me. You go to Ephraim. Like that, that didn't happen. Like he probably knew the 72. He taught thousands. He healed and fed thousands. And in his ministry, it's described this way. Jesus came in the fullness of grace and truth. So if you were Peter, or you were one of the 12, or you're one of the 72, you would have experienced grace, and you would have experienced truth in the presence of Jesus. Jesus came for the sick, not for the righteous. Luke 19.10 says that the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. He spent time with tax collectors, with the sinners, with the undesirables of the day. And Jesus took a little heat for that. He was scorned. He was judged. He was said, you know, they said, you've got a demon. They said, you're a drunkard. You're a glutton. Like they threw that at Jesus. Jesus never said, I'm not a glutton. I don't drink. He didn't care about that. He just said, his response is, I came for those who are lost. So I'm going to spend time with them. I'm going to be with them. I don't care what you think. Like he didn't come to try to prove himself. He came to be with the people who are hurting. He came for those who are lost. Jesus' purpose of discipleship. He calls disciples in order to make more disciples. John 20, 21, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. So in the same likeness, in the same manner, with the same purpose, with the same intentions, with the same values that I was sent by my Father, I now send you as my witness to represent me in all those ways from now on. We see Jesus meet with Saul on the road to Damascus. Saul, who later is called Paul. And Paul then begins a disciple-making ministry. We see lists of co-workers. One of them was this guy named Timothy. And he says there in 2 Timothy 2.2, Paul speaking to Timothy, the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So just look at the generations, just within scripture, the generations of disciples, of sent ones. The father sends the son. The son sends Paul. The Paul sends Timothy. Timothy sends faithful men. They send others. And from that line, you are here. If the disciples stop making disciples, you would not be Christians. God works through his church. God works through disciple making. Beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. There are feet involved in salvation. There's God's word, God's spirit, and there's feet. There's people, okay? There's you and there's me involved in salvation, sharing with people. So we are sent ones. The life and ministry of the Christian has a level of simplicity. We are called to be disciples who make disciples. We are sent ones, okay? We are sent ones. So there's a certain simplicity there. And we talked about this even on Sunday. Like when we wake up, are we thinking about making disciples? We make decisions about our resources, where we live, where we spend our time, what we do. Our, is it in order to make more disciples? Sometimes it just doesn't even cross our mind. But what Jesus is saying is if you're going in my likeness, it's, you're consumed with it. It's all you think about. Like that's why you get up in the morning is to be a part of making disciples. That's seeing people come to know Christ and watching people grow in Christ. Both components are discipleship. That's huge. So about three or four months ago, and there's gonna be some implications that are gonna come out that we won't get to today, but I was sitting there and 
God was really pushing this on me. Just are people, are you, Mike, and are the people that you're spending time with making more disciples? So if somebody asked me or asked one of you, how do people grow in Christ at Bible Center? Hopefully you would say, well, we worship, we belong, and we serve. Like that's kind of our pathways to growth here. And that's great. And I think those are biblically accurate. But if that's what we're, if we're putting people in the front of the funnel, my question in my head was, what's popping out the back of the funnel? Does that make sense? If we're saying, this is how we disciple, and this is our pathway, what's popping out the other side? Is it people obsessed with making disciples? And I just had to sit there honestly and just say, I don't know if I would say that's what we're producing. So how do we get better? Fix that problem for me. How do we get better? How do we become a church where we are becoming people who make more disciples like Jesus has called us to? What do you think? I think we just need to be more open about who we are and what we believe in, in, in normal ways. Hmm. Uh, I, I think of um, somebody asking me, how was your weekend? I said, well, I saw a great, we saw a great movie. We went to a restaurant. So I visited friends up in what? But how, why in the world don't I include in that we had a great um, worship service at church. The, the message was on forgiveness, and it was really, you know, convicting. It was to start the conversation. That's good. But we leave that part out. Mm. We don't mention anything about church. Good. If, if we're not, if we're weird about it, it's, mm. it's going to seem weird to other people. That's a good point. So Carol said we have to be more open with just our spiritual aspect of our life. And if we act like it's weird, that's a good point. If we act like it's weird and taboo, and you better believe people who aren't Christians are going to just assume it is taboo. So we have to make it not taboo. We have to make it normal. What else? How do we as a church start seeing disciples who make disciples? How do we become those people? We need to ask ourselves why we want to grow and learn. Hmm. Is it just for our personal reasons? Mm-hmm. You know, hmm. if I know everything in the Bible and understand everything God wanted. It doesn't do any good if I don't share it. That's good. So we got to make sure... We're coming to these core classes to learn. Mm-hmm. We have to share that. Mm-hmm. So the question isn't just, should we learn, but what do we do with what we learn? So there's like, has to be like, so what you're saying is if there's an inflow, we have to consider there needs to be an outflow. And that's what, like, have you ever hung out around a pond that's stagnant? Like maybe some water goes into it, but nothing comes out of it. You're not going to swim in that thing, are you? It becomes stagnant and stinky and stuff grows in it. Like, you don't want that. But... <laughs> or a person. You keep pumping calories into the person, but the person doesn't go anywhere or move anywhere. All right, that's also a bad situation. You know what I mean? So you, you don't want either of those circumstances, but it's really easy as Christians to, to do that. So we have to think of ourselves more as, um, as a flowing river than a dam. Like, that's maybe an illustration. So not a very good one. Only. Good point. So we're not disciples for the sake of our brains. He said it's not an academic pursuit only, which is totally right. And that's what it says in the Great Commission. We're called, to, um, we're called to make disciples partly by teaching others to obey what I've commanded. So it's not just to know what I've commanded, but it's to actually do what I've commanded. And even in the Great Commission itself, the imperative there is make disciples. So if we don't buy into making disciples, we're not even doing what we've been commanded to do. Like, we've, like step one, we're still stuck on step one of being a faithful disciple of Jesus. We have a tendency to be the secret society of the saints, Mm -hmm. and other people can't can't come in. We have a tendency to become a secret society of saints. That's very true. Some of it would be maybe too much reliance on our our own abilities. Mm. I mean, as as I uh, encounter uh, things in my life even, I try to think, well, how can I overcome this and and maybe forget that I have help and can overcome it through me. That's a good point. Sometimes we try to do it. I'm repeating you for the sake of the the podcast. Uh, Sometimes we do it just kind of out of our own power and we forget that we have the power of the Holy Spirit to rely upon. Sometimes, and I've found this multiple times in my life, sometimes you just have to start talking. Like that, if you just ask that first question, you'd be amazed how the Holy Spirit just jumps in and takes over. It's like sometimes he wants you to to start it and he'll take over it. He doesn't tell you how the conversation is going to go. Like you can never visualize exactly how this is going to work out. You can't. But you can trust that he's going to be with you through the process and give you words and give you wisdom and give you insight. And whatever he wants to accomplish in that moment is what he will accomplish. And if somebody says, no thanks, they're not rejecting you. You weren't presenting yourself. It's not, follow me. 
is to follow Jesus. He's the one that people choose to follow or choose not to follow. Any other quick thoughts? Those are good ones. I find it helpful to ask, ask people, how, how are you doing? How's your day going? I mean, this person who's checking you out at mm -hmm. Panera, she's got a name tag on, Amy, you know, hey, Amy, how's your day? Mm -hmm. And every once in a while, they say, like, oh, it's awful. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I can say, well, do you mind if I say a prayer for you? And mm -hmm. I mean, finish the transaction and don't get weird about it, but at least it's a start. That's good. So genuinely caring for people throughout your day as you're interacting with people, build relationships with the people you see frequently. I've heard a rumor that you, Matt Walker, stop at the same place to get a Coke Zero all the time. And you know all those people by name, don't you? Like you actually have a relationship with them. So it's taking advantage of those relationships and intentionally having one. Like, I think he's told me before, yeah, she broke up with her, with her boyfriend. And like, like, Matt actually knows those things about the individuals in that, in that convenience store. I think that's wonderful, because that gives him opportunities to like speak hope. And to help out. So, um, so yeah, I just think it's something we have to move from the back of our mind to the front of our mind. I totally agree. We don't. We have to start, stop thinking about. I don't know if I can do this. No, you can't. It's God who does it through you. So the answer is no, you can't. It's you can't. So you you just get started and see what God does, and you'd be amazed how He shows up. He's promised His power. He's promised His presence. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that there are disciples sitting here in this room. Uh, may we grow in our desire to make more disciples. In doing so, we experience you in the process. As we share the gospel, as we watch people grow, we receive joy. We grow in contentment. We grow in peace and excitement and a love for you. Uh, may we fall in love with being sent by you, Jesus. May we fall in love with the ministry that you've given each and every one of us. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you all for coming.